Good morning and welcome to another Sunday service on the 27th of December at Southcote Family Church. Whether you're with us regularly or whether you're just visiting us for the first time, it's lovely to have you with us this morning. Now, where do we go after Christmas? Maybe some of us had hoped the vaccine will have had a bit of an impact on our lives and would be freer to have services. Some of us are hopeful that we might have services by Easter. The truth is we don't know. At the moment, we're going to take a pause from all our activities until at least the 10th of January, and then we'll unroll what we're going to be doing, depending what the situation is regarding coronavirus. But at the moment, we haven't got anything on except our online services. I too will be taking some time away until the 10th of January, so we won't have any bulletins, but we will have a prayer meeting on the 7th of January, led by Judy. So thanks, Judy, in advance for preparing that. Our theme coming into the new year is all about looking ahead. Church behind the face mask. I don't know what your expectations were for 2020, and certainly our expectations for 2021 might be bleak. Maybe they're hopeful. Either way, what kind of church are we behind the face mask? We all wear types of face masks, whether it is fear, hope, joy, despair, whether we've tried to be isolating ourselves intentionally or unintentionally, we're all different people behind that face mask. And as we take the face mask off into 2021, we need to decide what kind of church are we going to be? Where are we going? What unexpected things will happen this year? And they will happen. So as a church, we're going to explore that by looking at 1 Corinthians, a church that also was hiding behind a face mask, a mask of pride, a mask of boasting, where they thought they were the best Christian church in the world. Now, I'm not saying that's the same as us, but in the same way, Paul takes off their face masks, reveals himself. He teaches them how to live for God. And we're going to take those lessons each week, a little by little, through Corinthians, to learn how can we live for God and prepare ourselves for when we do finally return as a church. I hope you enjoy the series and I hope you've got your notepads ready to explore 1 Corinthians with me. I'm quite excited and I'm really looking forward to joining in with you. The funny thing about starting the series is this week we're starting it, next week we have a guest speaker, Richard Baxter from Kerry Baptist Church, so we won't be doing uh, this series then, but we'll continue the week after on the 17th of January. Let us begin then this morning with a time of worship and then Karen is going to be bringing us our prayers and Graham is going to be bringing us our scripture reading before we have our message this morning.
heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Hope, peace, joy and love. Thank you, Father, that your everlasting love for us means that year by year we can celebrate the miraculous birth of your Son and know him as the one who was born to give us second birth, born to raise us to life with him and born that man no more may die. This is light in the darkness. This is your glory. And for those who revere your name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. We will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. The hope that Jesus brings is more than simply optimism. It is hope based on certainty that comes from knowing and experiencing your faithfulness, Lord, in our lives. Thank you that your promises are true and we can give you all that burdens us in the sure knowledge that you hear and answer all our prayers. Our hope is for a new year that leaves the darkness of this one behind. And as we put our trust in you, we pray for all affected by the events of 2020. That would be every single person on the planet, each with their unique set of circumstances and needs. We entrust each one to your care, Lord, whilst we pray for those whom we can name. For Dave and his family, for Judy and Pete in their love and concern, for Joe, Amy, Stanley and Ray, for Rob and Elizabeth, for David and Anna, for Cynthia and her brother Alan, for Paul and for Sue. Please add any I have missed in a moment of personal prayer. Whether in grief, in illness, battling Covid or in confusion and despair, we ask for a miracle of healing for all, for your light to pierce the darkness, for the presence of your peace that is wholeness, and for a touch of your joy to lift tired eyes to see you, the Saviour who entered the world to reconcile and redeem. The prayers of others are inspiring. The following words have helped me. May they also be a blessing to you. In a world where worry, not peace, prevails, stir up the good news again. This Christmas, make it real in our hearts. Never have we needed your joy and peace more than now. Thank you for the gift of Jesus, our Emmanuel, the Word made flesh. Forgive us for forgetting that your love never changes, never fades, and that you never abandon the purpose for which you came, to save us from sin and to give us life eternal the joy of relationship with a holy God. Precious Saviour, draw close to you all those whose hearts are battered, whose lives are conflicted and confused, and those whose bodies are tired and tested beyond their ability to endure. Let them know you are still the same Jesus who was born of a virgin. You are still the one sent by a heavenly Father, full of love and forgiveness. We crave your peace and joy, Lord, Joy that rises above and spills over the top of our circumstances, and peace that is a place of refuge and wholeness. Both have been crushed more than usual this year. Release them in us and show us again the beauty of that holy night so many centuries ago. Your name is still called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. We cry out for a fresh filling and a new awareness of who you are. We choose by faith to make the good news of great joy a reality in our lives, so that your light, shining in us, points to you this Christmas. You, Lord, are our joy and our peace. You are Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and we celebrate you this Christmas, always and forever. Amen. One Corinthians chapter one verses one to nine. Paul, 
called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's one particular chapter in Corinthians I think we all know very well, and it's a very popular chapter used in weddings as well. It's 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. It's all about love, the thing that our culture is obsessed by. Love is patient, love is kind, it's not self-seeking. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it doesn't keep record of wrongs. You know the one. It ends with these three remain, faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is, you got it, love. You said it before I did, I'm sure. It's interesting, though, that that is what we know most about Corinthians. That is possibly the passage we latch on to the most and discard the rest of the letter. Of course, the letter is a lot longer, bigger and hard to read in one sitting. However, that is how this letter would have been read to the churches of the day. Somebody who got the letter read it out while people sitting uncomfortably as they know Paul is probably talking a little bit about them. So we're exploring Corinthians uh, with the theme church behind the face mask and that's because the Corinthian church thought they were the best they boasted they were prideful chances are they thought they were already all the things love is supposed to be but actually when Paul says love is patient he was saying you're not patient love is kind you're not kind love does not envy and yet you envy love does not boast and yet you boast so what we see is Paul taking off the face mask of the Corinthians saying, look, what's behind the face mask? Look at what you've become because of the culture around you. Now, Corinthians was written around 57 AD while Paul was in Ephesus. And it was written to the capital of the province of Asia and where the Roman proconsul was. There was a term to say you could Corinthianize someone, which basically meant you become wanton you become debauched you're you're a person without moral you're amoral and this culture could have affected the purity of the church in Corinth the challenges of the church may have also been to do with style now Paul he was he was raised a Jew though a Roman citizen but he was called to reach the Gentiles so he went to the Gentiles but then came along as he trained other men to serve and to teach he's they, they were Greek speakers, so they had Greek style in the way they spoke. And the Corinthian church may have started saying, hey, I, I like that guy. I'm going to follow him, Apollos. That sounds like a good guy. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to follow Paul. And, and divisions began to emerge based on who you would follow. Who's the popular one? Who's the popular leader? Good job you don't have that problem here in our church, isn't it? So Paul writes with love to the church, but also with authority. He wants to guide this young church to live life to the glory of God in all that they do. And he actually writes that, whatever you do, do for the glory of God, not for your own glory. Not only is Paul ministering to a deeply divided church in terms of morals and spiritual life, they're divided even at the top regarding leadership. So we need to apply this in some way and we need to recognise that we're a deeply diverse group of people, not just here in Southgate Family Church, but across the Christian world. We're not always going to agree, yet we're also part of the body of Christ. There's lots of different parts, different functions, different gifts, different abilities, but we're the same body. We look to the same head, Jesus Christ. Now, over this series, we're going to take time to consider how we can be united and live for God whilst exploring our differences. We're going to look ahead to 2021, but where do we start? Well, we start 
with Christmas and Easter. So verse one, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, called by God with his brother Sosthenes. Now, Paul could have set himself up as an apostle without anybody uh, giving him any credence, but he didn't. He couldn't. He was the guy on the fringe. He was the one when he was called Saul who persecuted Christians. It was on uh, a road to Damascus that he met with Jesus, an encounter that blinded him for a short time. And he was breathing out at the time murderous threats against the Christian communities. He didn't experience Christ's personal ministry while he taught and preached and taught like Peter, James and John. But he experienced Christ personally on that road. And Jesus called him to that particular work. Now, we might say, well, that's convenient, Paul, but weren't you just trying to infiltrate the apostles? But again, no, because the apostles themselves welcomed him warily, but tested. And they saw the spirit of God at work in him through what he said, his devotion and his repentance. Paul himself describes himself as weak, the worst of sinners, because he knows what he has done in his past. And yet by the grace of God, he's been called to be an apostle. The call to be an apostle isn't a brag for him. It's not a boast. It's an act of grace. Sosthenes as well is an interesting mention. We don't pay him much attention when we teach from Corinthians because he's not really regarded in the letter at all. But there was a Sosthenes mentioned in Paul's trip to Corinth in Acts 18 verse 17. He was a synagogue ruler. Could it be Paul is bringing alongside a, a well-known Corinthian to the church to say, he's still with me and this boosts up my word. It's, it's sort of, this is someone you identify with and he's with me in the writing of this letter. Not only is Paul a little bit uh, dramatic uh, in regards to uh, en his entrance as a proclaimer of the good news, his writing might equally be dubious to the church. The church was full of issues any regular pastor would steer clear of, but Paul rolls up his sleeves and prepares to get messy with them. After all, if God could forgive Paul and transfer Paul, and Paul is quite honest about his weaknesses, I know why you think I'm a weak minister of the word, but I'm not called by you. I'm not called by anyone else. I'm not even called by the apostles. I'm called by God. If God could forgive and transform such a wicked man as Paul, what will he do for such a wicked church? Brown writes of the church in Corinth. What a paradox of grace. The church in Corinth. Corinth, so dubious. The church sanctified. And that's how it's described. Paul describes them as the sanctified. Now, that's another one of those theology words you need to get hold of. Sanctify means to be made holy. It, it means the, the cleaning of your soul by the blood of Jesus Christ. A bit like when you go spring cleaning in the house. God cleans the soul from sin through Jesus Christ. Not only sanctified, but cold. Now imagine a sea captain in the 1800s gathering a crew together. He doesn't necessarily have the ability to gather the best of the best. He just chooses men who are willing to serve him and then he trains them en route. They may be a ragtag of sailors, but they're under his command. And it's the same with God. He calls us to serve with him aboard his ship, the church, and train us along the way. We may not be the best examples of what it means to be Christian, but he's going to call us to be the best if we can follow him and trust him. And that's why we start at Christmas and Easter. That's why we come back. To those two festivals. Both are celebrations of the gift of God. But we don't hang on them uh, to, for too long. We, we don't stay at Christmas. We don't stay at Easter. We get on with the calling that these events begin. Easter and Christmas is like the captain calling the people and they says, now go, now go out, make it so. Let's see what's out there. Get the job done. A new season is beginning for Paul, who's getting ready to look at Corinth and say, let's get the foundations right. Who are you? Or who am I? What am I called to do? What are you called to do? Are you ready to begin?
Are you ready to begin? Verse 2 of chapter 1 connects the church of Corinth with all believers. You see, whether they call upon the name of Jesus in Corinth, Ephesus, Jerusalem, they're part of the same body. Now, this is really important because Paul is going to go on in this chapter to say, why are you so divided? Why is there division? Why do you think you're better than this group of Christians over here? Recognizing that we're part of a bigger body humbles us. It, it makes us realize that, you know what, we're not the only church in town. We're not the only Christians. It, it's a bit like sometimes churches are like Olympians and they're going to a particular area to run a particular race. But those Olympians represent a larger country and they wave their country's flag knowing that their countrymen are back home cheering. Even some of them are in the stadium, they're cheering. The same with church. Wherever we are, wherever we're based, we're part of the same body and we're cheering each other on. We're praying for one another. And one of our attitudes, certainly at the beginning of a new year, as we look behind the mask, is to say, I'm part of something bigger, the body of Christ. Christian family should look like this. Not just looking to our own interests, but to the interests of others. So we call on the name of Jesus. And when we do, we're doing the same as that Iranian family in hiding from persecution in Iran. When we do, we're joining the African communities who are grieving the loss of life in places like Ethiopia. 
and Nigeria. When we do, we're joining the American man on death row who has just come to repentance of faith and calls on the name of the Lord. He calls for his saviour. Do we call for our saviour in recognition that we're not alone in that? So many are calling on the name of Jesus and they don't realise that there are thousands around the world joining with them. Of course, though we're part of something big, it isn't just the number that is important, is it? What is significant is the power of Christ himself. Paul doesn't focus so much on that you are part of a big number. He says you're part of a number who are called by Jesus Christ. This is who you are. This is what you do because you are called by Christ. This is significant to the church in Corinth who might be tempted to think they're better, they're the only ones. It might be tempting us to think we're so poor, we're so low in number, we, we, we don't have the, the, the numbers, we don't have the community, we can't produce the brilliant videos other churches can produce. And I tell you, I feel that pressure. I do. Every time I, I record to preach, I think, oh, wow, you compare this to like other big churches in Reading. Wow. But we're not called to produce brilliant online videos. We're not called to simply watch them on a Sunday and then go about our week. We're called to be the children of God and his messages. We're called to be his church wherever we are. And that's our first challenge. Who have we become behind the face mask? Well, let's not forget who we are under Christ. Look at verse four, where Paul thanks God for this church, this messy church, because of the grace that's been given in Christ Jesus. You have grace given. Do we live in that grace? Do we live in what we don't have or in the grace that we have got? Do we live with an empty Christmas tree or do we live with actually the gift that Christ has given us that fills our souls? And it may be an uncomfortable grace in that we have an opportunity to know it through suffering and through, through trial. You know, grace happens in good ways and it happens in good ways in bad times. In verse five, he compliments the church. He says, you know, your, your, your gifts, look what you have. You're good at preaching. You're good at teaching. You have these for you. But equally remember, Corinth's a little prideful. So he's saying, yes, you've got these things, but why are you the way you are? If you're good at this, I'm encouraging you. So why is there division among you? They have these gifts, but how do they use them? If you have a gift of God, do we use it? It's like having the best gift in the world given to us and we never use it. Paul will be coming later to address the pride of the Corinthians. And he's going to challenge their use of gifts and how they use those gifts and how they compare gifts to one another. We must be careful not to lose our strengths, whatever they may be, appear to be, and lose them to become objects of pride, which is so easily done. We can become prideful about the gifts that God has given us. Let us be humble. Let us recognize out of our weakness what we have and give thanks to God for them. We are merely granted gifts by God who gives good gifts to his children. Like the stewards with the talents, how will we use what we have? Then in verse six, Paul justifies the testimony of his gospel work. He talks about the confirmations of the work he's been doing. Now for us, these confirmations, we would need to look over ourselves. We'd have to dig deep into Paul's life and ministry to see if what he says is true. But Paul says, my life is on display. Sosthenes is here with me, ask him. Others who I have known, talk to them. This is why he lists other people in his letters. That he's not working by himself. He's not seeking glory for himself. He's not seeking self-worship. He puts his weaknesses on the line and says, this is who I am. Not only is his testimony up for scrutiny, but the testimony of every other believer who he has come into contact with. 
gifts in verse 7 are also an interesting thing to look at. And we'll be looking at them more deeply in this series. We discover in this letter that there are many gifts and many different people who bear them. And they're all different. Not, no two gifts are exactly the same because your personality shapes your gift. Every spiritual gift available to these people is there for them to take hold of. But have they taken hold of it? You see, we have some gifts and opportunities, even in these dark days. And the question for us as a church is, are we going to take hold of them? Are we going to ask Christ, who by grace has given us the gifts, who has sanctified his church, who has equipped his church, united his church, are we going to go with what he's given us? Or are we going to hide our light under the bushel? As we draw to a close on this message, we're called to look onwards. In verse eight and nine, the Greek verb implies to expect constantly, not only for a certain time, but even to the end, till the expected event happens. The people are called to be expecting Christ. You see, to live in a certain way, to live for something, you need to have a hope on the horizon. I've been enjoying the idea of looking at the horizon at what's ahead, but dealing with what is with us now. You see, we can get caught up in the storm of life now. We can look at all the problems now and not pay any attention to what's coming up in the future. As a church, we're called to look and keep our eyes on the horizon and deal with the now. So Paul is saying, look at the horizon. Christ is coming. God's going to do this. God is going to bring this to fulfillment. Keep your eyes on that hope until you receive it. Meanwhile, let's get to work on attitude. And he goes on in to talk about unity. So again, the question, who are we? What are we? What do we do? We've got all these gifts from believing in Jesus because of his love and grace. But what are we going to do with it? You and I, we are sanctified and called to be God's holy people. We are granted the gifts, the spiritual gifts, to work together as proclaimers of the Lord. We have the hope of glory on the horizon, but there may be some time before we get there. The Corinthian church, they had a pride issue, and that's what Paul's about to go on and address. But what's our issue? What are we going to uncover that stops us from looking at that horizon, from living to live for God in, full, in fullness and in abundance? As a church or as an, as a church or as an, as a church or as an individual, what is stopping us from receiving God as part of, and being part of the body of Christ? What do you say? So what do you say in regards to looking ahead this year? Are you going to embrace this new season in 2021? Are you going to pick up some of the tools that God is equipping you with and use them in whatever context you find yourself? Are you ready to trust God with the identity he has given you as a believer in the church of God? Are you ready to unpack the wonderful opportunities he's prepared for us? God is ready to guide us and lead us into 2021. God has been waiting for you. Are you going to follow him this day, this week, this new year? Let's take a moment then to consider these words as we close in prayer and listen to our closing song. Dear God, lead us, we pray, into the future, recognising who we are under Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. at your command the old departs the new year comes and though celestial is your gaze you search and care for all our ways we offer up to you this day and all of our tomorrows
zealous youth and cautious age determine not the steps we choose great shepherd guide us through each day oh how we want to follow you come living way our way may clear let perfect love drive out our Saints, the sun once came.